And now, for something completely different, we're going to take a look at a digital game with some definite board game roots, Rogue Book, a roguelike deck builder. Before we get into the nitty gritty, I want to thank NACOM for providing us with an early access code for the demo version of Rogue Book. All right, Rogue Book was developed by Ab Abracam Entertainment. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Shows how much I know about video games. Uh, this is the team behind Feria, whatever that is, who partnered up with Richard Garfield to create this game. Now, that's a name I know. That's a name all hobby gamers should know and recognize as the man behind Robo Rally and the great Dal Moody. Okay, well, maybe that's just me. Those are the games I love. Most people are going to know that name from Magic the Gathering, uh, the most popular card game uh, i'd say in the world but you could probably still beats it out somehow but as far as hobby games go you can't beat magic the gathering for its renown as soon as i read the first press release stating that richard garfield was working on a digital deck building game i jumped at a chance to check this game out now rogue book is currently up for pre-order at humble bundle it's expected to enter full release in april now if you pre-order now you get access to the demo version of the game which is what i've been playing now, this demo version does limit you to one specific hero, hero pair. It doesn't allow for persistent progression through skill trees and limits everything to the first six levels. So I think it should be obvious, but we don't have an unboxing for this one. It's a digital world we live in. Yeah, I could show you it installing maybe on my computer. That's about it or my Steam update key. Um, so Roguebook bills itself as a deck building roguelike and well that's what it is uh you start off each game at level one with your hero you then go recruit a companion to journey with uh in this demo you're limited to one specific character so one pair but there will be more in the full game unlock uh you then walk across the hex grid to the main gates and start exploring now the world you're exploring in rogue book is made up of a hex map only part of which you can see you get the little starting area where you choose your companions and the gate. And then once you open the gate, it draws a path to the end, to the tower where the first boss monster is. Now I say draws. This is where the whole book part of Rogue Book comes in. Uh, the whole theme here is that, like if you're exploring a book, it's opened up like a book and you're walking around like a little miniature on this book that's getting drawn into the book as you're exploring. And a big part of this exploration is using a resource specifically called ink to reveal more of the map or to draw more of the map. You start the game with five pots of ink. Actually, you start each level with five pots of ink, which is worth noting, which can be used to draw in the, the ink you start with, the hexes surrounding your character. As only a path of the boss is revealed at the start, you're going to want to do this, right? You're, you could rush right to the boss, but you're going to want to reveal more parts of the map by using your ink. When you do this, you're going to find all kinds of stuff shows up on the map, right? You got gold sitting there to pick up. You got Vault of Wisdoms, which lets you go spend 40 gold to get a new card. Uh, you're going to get three to pick from. You pick one of the three cards. There's Wandering Merchants that let you spend your gold to buy cards, uh, artifacts, and gems. More about those in a bit. There's these uh, towers where if you go to a tower, they reveal the map around them. So they're a really good way to show off big sections of the map. Uh, there's runes of sight where if you do one of those, they're going to pick something cool on the map that you can't see and reveal the area around it. So it might be like a, a gem over in the corner, or a pile of gold over here, and it'll show you that. Um, there's an alchemist lab that lets you transform your cards. So you take your basic cards and replace them with better cards. So you transform your, you know, a typical deck building thing where you're getting rid of your basic starter hand for better cards. Uh, there's hearts where you heal your characters 10 each. And one of the big things is monsters to fight at various difficulty levels. And it kind of warns you, this is an elite fight. This is an easy fight. Now, when you do defeat a monster, you'll get gold and other rewards. Uh, usually, uh, just gold for the weak ones and then better rewards for the elites. And you'll get things like new car cards, items, gems, and artifacts. But more importantly at this point is you will get a pot of special ink. Now these special inks work like your regular ink, but will reveal parts of the map different ways. So I don't remember the names of them and I'll probably never remember the names of them, but one does like a straight line of five hexes. Another one does three hexes in opposite directions and you pit which direction that is. Uh, there's another one that actually uses up your main ink, but it does like a big blotch of five range around you or three range around you. And there's all kinds of different inks. So aside from the, the ink uh, and the way it's sort of unveiling the fog of war uh nothing especially all that unfamiliar to most card battlers and roguelike lovers yeah as far as i know i i will admit i am not 
greatly experienced in i played a few different ones mostly on mobile um not a lot of steam games but this does seem pretty straightforward with with this interesting theme and look to it so what uh, what some of this stuff does right those stuff you can pick up so like ink reveals more on the map gold is used at the merchants and vaults to get new cards and improve your deck uh the card improvements are done with gems so i mentioned getting gems so this is something that from what i understand is new in this game is every card has a number of sockets on it so your basic cards have one socket the ones you get when you first start playing will have two sockets and i guess you can have that more later in the game each socket can hold a gem and what gems do is make a permanent improvement to the card now these are not minor this isn't like a little do plus one damage it's more like do plus 14 damage to the closest enemy and what's interesting is you could socket that on any card so you could have it on a card that's like draw two new cards and do 14 damage it doesn't have to go like on a damage card or it could be on one of your defensive cards so your defensive card also does damage or it could be on like your buff that buffs the guy behind you or whatever right um another example is just draw more cards right which if anyone's played any deck builder the best cards in your deck are the ones that let you draw more cards because they don't really take room in your deck right well you throw a draw an additional card on your standard defense card and now it's a way better card there's tons items are equipped on your characters. Now, remember, you have your main character and your companion. They're both your heroes. You put an item on your character to give them some kind of bonus. Uh, again, additional damage, starting with certain cards in your hand, starting with an ally in play, healing, all kinds of stuff, right? Roguelite. Think, think Diablo and the number of different items it can drop. Artifacts are the biggest, most powerful items. Those are global effects that are always in play. And they're going to affect both your characters and give some kind of benefit. Now, at the start of every floor in the game, there are four artifacts in the four far corners of the map, though there's no way you're going to get all of them, which we'll get to in a minute. So if you do want one, you're probably going to have to be pretty strategic with using your ink to make sure you get it. So it's interesting that it's a flexible card upgrade system yeah. when most of the roguelike deck builders tend to be... Um, a straight upgrade so the, the the card is this and it upgrades to this and that's it yeah no this is completely customizable this is you decide what gem to go onto what card in each of your character's decks right so your deck's actually made up of cards for both your characters so you actually get to decide which hero is going to even get that bonus now as for battling um again this is a deck builder right um the big difference here from other physical and digital deck builders i played is that you are playing two characters and your deck is mixed with cards from both of those characters and they're very well easily co color coded you have the white and the orange character to start now when battling every battle starts with one of your two characters in the front you can change the default and this position matters whether they're in the front or the back during the fight now for one you're going to get a bonus for who's in front at either the start or end of each round. So your default characters, I don't remember their names, sorry. Your default characters are, one of them gets plus two defense if they're in the front at the end of the round, and the other gets plus two to all their attacks if they're in the front. So depending on if you're going for attack and you're defending that round, you may want to swap them up. You get a hand of five cards and you get three mana to use them. Now this is a big difference from every physical deck builder I played, but I know it's common in digital deck builders where you're not playing your whole hand every turn. Anyone who's playing Ascension Star Realms is used to playing everything. These digital deck builders seem to have moved away from that for some reason. It's all about only playing certain cards from your hand. All the starting cans, cards only cost one mana, and you have three mana to use. So at the start of the game, before you've improved everything, you're only going to play three of your five cards every turn. Now, the most expensive card I've seen so far playing cost five, but it was one that went down every time you used a different card from the same character at the same time. So it's a five, but then if I used an attack and a basic defense, it's down to a three. Note there are cards that increase that mana level, as well as artifacts and items that can increase the mana level. So you can get up to playing more cards. Now, when battling, you're going to face one or more enemies. I've seen up to six. Again, the order matters. So the a monster in the front is different than the monster in the back. Most cards in your deck are split between attack and defense cards. Attacks do damage to a specific target. So when you play the card, you pick which of the enemies to attack. Defense moves the defending character to the front if they're not, and then gives you a number of shields. Each point in shields you have box one point of attack when the opponents attack. With this, it's a deck builder. It's a card game. It's designed by Richard Garfield. There's way more. 
I, I, there's no way I can get into it here. I'm not going to mention every card. There's keywords. There's lots of keywords. Uh, one example is charge. It does extra damage, but moves the character to the front. Uh, missile cards are cheaper, which I thought was great if they're used in the back, as well as getting as cheap as zero, which could get you to that being able to play all five of your cards. Uh, there are allies, all kinds of types of cards. Now, allies are, I thought, are unique to this. I'd never seen this in any deck builders I played. Um, these stay in play. So it's kind of like a summon in magic, I guess, in a way, but different. So it's it's a card that you pay. They're always expensive. They usually cost two or three. So they cost a lot of your mana to put up, but then they stay in play each round. They have a power level that goes down every round. So a countdown. So if you play an ally with a five, he's going to be in play for five rounds. Uh, then they're going to do something. Like there's allies that defend for you. There's allies that attack for you. They're usually tied to the character that played them. So for example, the one that attacks every round has the same attack power that that character had that round. So it only actually like works if you pair them up. Um, many of them actually have abilities you can use too by clicking on the card that gives you a new thing you can do every round. Uh, interestingly, one of the better items I found in play actually had you start with allies in play. At the beginning of every round, your character started with allies. Um, then there's a bunch of stuff based on the fact you have two characters, like cards that buff the other character, cards that put another character in front, uh, let you swap positions and so on. Yeah. The, the multi-character aspect is interesting, but what I'm, I'm really noticing, um, and again, I'm, I'm much more of a computer game player of this mm -hmm. type, especially than you, is that they've really taken a lot of aspects from various different games and mash mm -hmm. them all together into one meta game. Is it, I mean, this is this is really sort of the 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 meta deck uh, deck builder roguelike of all deck builder roguelikes. <laughs> right. Um, the one the one unique aspect that that just I haven't come across and I can't find I can't think of in any games I've played that is unique is this ink concept. Right. Yeah, that was definitely different to get used to. Um, and then that, I guess it makes sense, right? If you're going to put out a new roguelike deck builder, you base it on all the successful ones that are already out there. So jumping back to combat. So everything has hit points. Once you get rid of those, that creature or character dies, um, which I want to bring up because death, I think, is pretty unique. When one of your characters dies, you're going to put two wound cards in your deck. These are the garbage cards. You'll recognize these from a bunch of physical deck builders. These are the cards that do literally nothing. They just take up room in your deck. And when you draw them, you're just like, oh, I have wound cards. Um, and then the other thing it does is it takes all of that characters. Remember, you have two heroes. So one hero is unconscious. Their entire set of cards flips. So like, I don't know if it was physical, I'd flip the cards over, but like they switch to a new type of card, which are called revive cards. What they do is they say specifically on them is play three of these and the character revives. Now this doesn't have to be done in one round. Like you don't have to get lucky and draw three of the same character. You can build it up. Like I play one this round and then two the next round. If you manage to get these in play, you will then the character will stand up. They'll get back up and they come back with a handful of health. Uh, it's not a lot, like it's like 15 to 12, and they probably won't last long. But then you can also use their cards, including the round they came back up. Now, if at any point both your characters are knocked out, game's over. Game's done. Now, while playing, your characters will level up in an interesting way. This progression is based on how many cards are in your deck. Soon as you get your deck to 14 cards, you get your unlock. Then another at 18 cards, 22 cards, and finally 26 cards in your deck. Now, at each unlock point, you're going to pick an ability. And what it is, is each character has abilities, and then there's a team ability. So at the first unlock, it's do you want to unlock the ability for Hero 1, the ability for Hero 2, or a team ability? Well, the Hero 1 abilities affect Hero 1, the Hero 2 abilities affect Hero 2, and the team abilities affect both. Yeah, it's interesting because in a lot of games, you know, in a deck builder, so often deck size is a negative. Mm -hmm. But here, they're actually encouraging you to build up the size of yeah. your deck. Uh, is there even a way to thin your deck at all? You did mention you could transform yeah. your, your basic cards to better ones. So the only way to get rid of a card in your deck is to go to the Alchemist and transform it into a new card. Right. So now, when you, you never lose cards, you just change what they are. Yes. You replace a, a lousy starter card that gives you plus five defense and you transmute it into this like great card and when you transmute you like not only get a card you get some gems like it, it right it's very expensive um i've done it very seldom but it's very powerful because for one it gets rid of a lousy card and gives you a good card 
So that's that's kind of it, right? You you go around exploring the map using the ink. Uh, you're trying to improve your deck. You kill the monsters, get more ink to explore new areas, and eventually you're going to run out of ink. And when you do that, you got to go take on the boss monster. If you're able to beat them, and I got to say, if they are not easy, you'll move to the next floor. Once you inevitably end up dying, remember this is a roguelike, you're going to start over at the beginning of the game, back on floor one again, and you're going to pick a companion. And in the demo, you're going to pick the same companion every time because they only unlock the one. While playing, hopefully you found, I don't know what they're called. They, they, they look like slips of paper with runes on them, scrolls. I don't know. They're, they're loose, I, whatever they are. Uh, they don't show up very often. Like, like every now and then they'll show up on the map. And when they do, like you're like, yes, thank you for showing up. You do get them for some battles, um, elite bosses, and you will definitely get one if you beat a boss, if not two. These you use for permanent progression on a skill tree. And it's a typical branching skill tree with all kinds of stuff on it. Um, your basic unlock lets you unlock a new team power. And then there's a different basic unlock. And you need lots of these. Like to, to unlock the first one takes one, but then the next one takes five. Which means you're going to probably have to play through three or four times to get to that next one. And like to fill this whole tree, you're looking at hundreds possibly thousands of plays like like i i can't i didn't get very far in the in the skill trees so there's that there is also another form of progression every time you play the character you play gets experience points what i haven't figured out is how that's determined i have no idea i just i play it and the bar goes up so far i don't know i don't know where that's coming from it's done in the background if you get it to the level end you then get to add better cards to their decks and again, this is permanent, which the next game you start, you're going to start with these better decks. So yeah, this the, the leveling is is yet another feature from yet another game that I hadn't actually added to the list yet of games <laughs> this game is made up of. <laughs> yeah, so so yeah, this is pieces parts, right? Um, so what all this leads to is, like I said, what, what, what is known as the grind, right? Uh, the entire game is about grinding and very gradual progression. You play it over and over and over again, making small incremental improvements to your heroes and decks, hoping each time you get a little further into the game and you find more of those skill sheets of paper and you get further into the rogue book. And well, that's what a roguelike is, right? And this is a roguelike. Yeah, they've certainly nailed the concept down with the name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's no question of what you're getting out of this. You're getting a roguelike in a book. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Road card or yeah. rogue deck builder is about the only thing they could have done to get it better. So uh, thoughts on it overall. Uh, I had fun. It, it's well-designed. It uh, looks great. I didn't see a single glitch or technical flaw or anything. Um, I was invited to a Discord channel where I did see people who found small little, like this card didn't quite work right. But it's it didn't feel like a beta or anything like that. This feels polished. Uh, the music's good. The art's good. Uh, one complaint is when you do start the game, you have to watch the animation and you have to watch that every time. Oh. So that was that that can be a little annoying. Um, I will admit I was disappointed when I found out my review copy was only the pre-order demo. Uh, but there was, you know what, there's plenty of content there. Like it kept me busy. It let me experience pretty much all the game. I would have loved to have tried different heroes, but like I didn't get far enough in that I hit the level six cap. No way. Like I, like I play these games, but. Uh, it, 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 this is a, this is a fun game. I, it's a good time killer. Now, what I didn't do with this, and I don't know if this is a knock against or what, how most people play these games, but I never like spent an evening playing Rogue Book and playing through level one over and over and over and over again. What I would do is I would spend a day blogging or writing a review or sharing deals on tabletop deals. And then I'd sit there and before going downstairs to watch Netflix, I play one round. I, I would start fresh. I'd grab my companion. I'd go out. I'd get, get past level one, maybe, or whatever. And that's it. And then I'd go watch Netflix or whatever. And then go do something else. Maybe that same day I do another run. Like maybe I'm taking a break in the middle of the day. I'm like, I'm going to go grab lunch. And it, it's a good lunch game, right? Like you have a sandwich in one hand and kind of click around. I'm not having to type. You don't have to type while you're playing. So I'd have a sandwich while playing. I'd do one run. And then again, before going to bed, I'd play one more run, right? Like it was it, play it once, get through it, and maybe later play again. I don't know about you, how you play. Yeah, no, like I, I have to say when it, when I'm, if I'm pulling up Slay or, uh, or one of the, one of the various ones, it's generally, I might, at most I do, I would, I would do three if I had, okay. you know, a, a chunk of time, but that's about the most number of runs I do. I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if I was consuming this, how people would normally consume this. Or well, not. I think, you know, again, a lot of these, it's, it's like Animal Crossing, right? You, yeah. people will play it the way they play it. I'm sure there are people out there oh, who yeah. grind away and, and more power to them. 
that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, for me, you know, a couple or three runs, yeah. then move on. So there you go. So, so that's not unusual. So the, the deck building combat system solid. Um, like it's an in, what I like is there's a bit of mix of decks construction and deck building, right? So you're doing your deck construction between fights and then your deck building while you're playing. So that was nice. I did like the gem system. I thought that was really neat. Mm -hmm. And man, you can make some really powerful cards. Like 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 the ability to combo a defensive card with an extra attack and stuff like that. Um, I like the item system finding an item and having to decide which hero to give it to was like a valid choice. Like, I'm yeah. like, Oh man, Oh, do I want to give that to him or her? And, and those were all well done. Um, the, the two com character combat system, I really liked, like as soon as I got my first missile card, I was like, Oh, that's brilliant. And it's the fact that it's a, a one cost attack that does, you know, 12 damage, which is pretty good. But if you're in the back, it's free. It's a zero cost. And I, I like that. I, I like that positioning matter. Right. Now, the one thing I don't like or didn't like or I, I don't even know is that that exploration system, right? The problem is you don't get enough ink. Even if you fight every fight on the map and you win every fight and you hit every tower and you hit every vision square, you will not reveal the entire map. And that drove me nuts. Because, like, to me, that's part of a roguelike. Like, like that's, that's where this deviates from being a roguelike because going back to rogue, like the game that these the roguelike is named on is a game I used to play with my dad on the Amiga. We used to play the original rogue. You always made sure to explore the entire floor before going deeper. Never go down until you've explored the entire floor, unless you fall in a pit trap and then you're mad because you didn't get to explore the entire floor. You might've missed out on a sword or one extra speed or a spell or some food. Oh, the food was so important in that game. And that's not the case here. And it's by design. Like they, they made the game knowing you won't explore the whole map but i want to see the whole map i want to collect all the stuff like i felt like i was being forced to fight the boss i get it i i, I played the game enough that's this is rogue book this is not rogue i i guess i have to accept it i don't like it but it is part of what makes this game unique yeah i can definitely see how when you're expecting a roguelike the map just being revealed as you move through is something you take for granted. I mean, it's yeah. mapping mapping it out is is what you do. <laughs> now, one thing I think everyone is going to want to know, everyone listening right now, if they haven't completely tuned out, is how does this game compare to other deck building roguelike games? Uh, the big one, the, the the big boy everyone's talking about is Slay the Spire. Now, right now, I will say I have played a few of these. I don't have the names memorized. I tried a few different ones, mainly app-based ones. Um, I had more fun with this than any other digital deck building game of this type. Now, I'm not saying every digital deck builder. I still love Star Realms. I still like Ascension. That's a totally different thing. I'm talking about these roguelike, uh, constant progression, try to beat the boss, go up the levels kind of game. So this beats everyone I played. But I haven't played Slay the Spire. That's that's the, the the number one for most people. Now, I know Sean has played it quite a bit from what I know, and I know you haven't played Rogue Book, but I think I did a pretty good job describing it that you can tell what's different. So what do you, how would you compare those two games? Well, it's interesting because this game touches some aspects of Slay the Spire uh, with the deck building, the repeated grinding, keywords, even allies in a, in a way, although it, they're called powers in, um, yeah. in Slay the Spire. Uh, but it also goes well beyond that with party members, uh, varied upgrades, uh, rather than just the, you know, one, one possible upgrade for a card, uh, and the very concept of a dungeon with a fog of war in slay, okay. there's no movement mystery. You've got a, a path tree that, you know, from the moment you oh, start, wow. okay. um, there, there's one bad guy and you, there are four possible places you can start and a tree to get there. So you've got some choices to make, but. There's no confusion. It's it's you're going to start here and and go up and you know what every step along the way is from the beginning. Um, yeah, that is very different. Like yeah. like this, you have a lot of agency over even where you explore. Do you rush to the boss? Do you go off to the left? Right. You you hit one of those vision runes and all of a sudden an artifact shows up and it's close and you can reach it. Do you try to get to that? Um, one of the big things is just trying to find places to get you new cards. Right. And if you found one of those, then finding the gold and, and healing is sparse. If you get lucky <laughs> and find some healing, that's another one. But the I do really like the exploration, even though I hate the exploration because I want to explore everything. But that is definitely a big difference in this game. So I find it actually compares a little bit more 
to my personal favorite deck builder beyond Slay the Spire, and that is Monster Slayers. Okay. Um, because it actually has exploring. Um, okay. it, you don't even know where the boss is when you get in there. Wow. When okay. you first start. Um, it's, uh, it's not a full map. It's actually just paths, but they're all dark to you until you've mm -hmm. wandered around. Um, now they do, have, there is a second character or additional characters in Monster Slayers, but you don't play them. They're just more backup. Um, okay. they're more like the allies you've got in, uh, that game. Um, and then, um, there are the unlockable upgrades for your characters between runs right. and things like that. Um, but then also you've got, um, Erratus Loader, Lord of the Dead, which really plays into that sort of the or player order and raising someone up if one, if one of your party members dies. Okay. Um, there's so much of that. And again, I, I, you know, pointed out before that ink is yeah. kind of the special sauce that while they've taken from so many other games, they've added this one unique to me item that, that brings it all together into its own concept. And that's the book thing as well. Yeah. The whole book thing. All right. I think that's a pretty good comparison of them from, I wish I had two coats so you could have tried it, but. Just so yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it, it really is because again, they've they've taken so many concepts yeah. from the different games. Um, I, one of the things I think that would be a big difference between Slay the Spire is there seems to be more thought involved in Rogue Book. Uh, Slay yeah. the one thing about Slay the Spire is the reason I'll play three three rounds of it is because for the most part it's pretty clicky. Um, yeah. I know I'm going to remove the basic attacks from my deck. I know generally, depending on which character class I'm playing, what my with my play style, which cards I'm going to add into my deck right. when they come up. Um, there aren't a lot, you know, the upgrading is literally, you know, am I going to upgrade this card or not? It's only going to yeah. go to one other thing. So it's it's very um, quickly playable. You know, it's mm. a great lunchtime game because you can sit there eating a sandwich and, and, and clicking away. And there's a lot you can do without heavy thought. Whereas I think Roadbook, there's there's more investment and and brain power there. Yeah, even in the fights, like you're not just clicking through your decks. There's a big difference. You get an icon over. So I, again, I didn't get into all the detail, but the combat. But you get an icon over the enemy's head showing what they're going to do in the next turn. That's pretty. And standard. you'll even see how much damage they're going to do. Yeah, that's that's so, pretty standard. Okay, so it's it's a lot of strategy of the do I put up my defenses or do I attack, especially if they're going to buff. Right. right. So you're like, I don't need to defend this round. What do I do instead? And then trying to tailor your deck so you have that balance of defense and attack. Because that is one thing I did wrong in this game <laughs> is I ignored defense once and just went for all attack cards. And it was great till I got to the boss that was doing 60 points of damage. But like it was it was awesome until that point. Yeah. What I should have done, and this is a mistake on my part, is I should have live streamed playing this and then you could have watched and saw it right. and i didn't even think of doing that ahead of time maybe still we'll do a live stream for for those of you listening or watching let us know if you're interested in that maybe it's something i'll do at some point i do still have the game so overall i thought rogue book was a very polished solid enjoyable game while it didn't suck me into that point where i was spending hours playing through game after game and grinding it all at once i thought it was a great game that i'd pop on do a run and then go do something else and then maybe come back later that day or the next day to me it was like a break game it was a, a lunch break game though not necessarily always played at lunch now it did do a good job of scratching that deck building card game itch uh, i did enjoy the unique elements of this particular Euler rogue builder roguelike deck builder uh, from the other ones i played and it sounds like it's got even more well <laughs> similar to a bunch of different games kind of mm. mashed together into one I, you can definitely see the tabletop game roots here uh if you play tabletop card games it feels like a tabletop card game i think it's got a lot of richard garfield in it especially with the different keywords and how the cards interact and how they combo and the there's no real rock paper scissors but the whole this obviously counteracts this feel to the game if you enjoy these kind of digital deck building games, I recommend picking up Rogue Book. Um, if you're a tabletop deck building fan, you might want to check this out, uh, especially nowadays if you're stuck at home and lock, locked down and you don't have anyone to play deck builder with. This is a probably worth noting a 100% solo experience. There is no multiplayer mode. There's no way for me to challenge Sean or fight Sean's heroes in Rogue Book. This is a solo game only. If you don't like roguelike style play where you're going to play the same game over and over and over and start from scratch with just a little bit of an advantage over the last time this game won't be for you personally i'm glad i got to try it out 
All right, well, you can check out Mo's written review of Roguebook by heading over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Reviews.